Hello and welcome to the Swiss Cup in Basel. Semi-final of this event of the Curling Champions Tour. Sven Michel against Andreas Lang. My name is Renato Hechler and with me commentating is Daniel Raphael. Hi Daniel. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Good. Just had a bit of food and we're ready to go. So we're right here, beginning the first end. Second stone here. Teams had a five minute practice before that. Could get used to the ice and the rocks. I think that's what we expected, Daniel, this uh, defensive start, getting used to the conditions. So we started with 32 teams, now we're down to four. Quite some people dropping out here. Mm -hmm. Some still hanging around for the free food. Exactly, free food downstairs. Mm -hmm. That's good food. Yeah. Good reason to hang around here. Good competition anyway. Always a pleasure to play here. It's uh, for the teams and the and the uh, people around the curling area, Basel. This is a big event here. Some of the best men's teams playing here this weekend. And as you said, we're down to the last four. So with the uh, the Langstone slipping in a not so good position for for Germany, they decided to uh, just draw in, maybe use that redstone later to freeze. So always keep it. Keep an option open. Of course, Sven Mikael, Team Mikael, always looking for stones to work with and normally high scoring. And especially in this first end, uh, this is a, a free option, so to say, that mm -hmm. stone behind the T-line is an option with no risk, actually, you can, you can work with. Mm -hmm. As long as you have the front open, Problem is, you always want to keep your your options open. That's why he he could have left that redstone that uh, the German team just threw, let it stop and create more backing. But uh, they probably just figured now we'll just hit and uh, keep the end clean. It's always a difficult thing finding the balance between. Uh, having options and going a little more risk, mm -hmm. isn't it? Well, the other thing that it will dictate, especially the first couple of ends, is the, uh, the fact that they're now using the time clocks. So, you know, a lot, of, a lot of teams, especially, you know, 10 in games, you know, they try to play a little bit more conservative, a little bit more open in the first couple of ends just to bank some time because they know if they get down to the last few ends of the game and they have to make some long decisions, uh, the clock is running. And you certainly don't want to lose because your clock is run out. Yeah, for all the new curlers, it doesn't take that much time to play an end in, in this style, uh, keeping it open, playing the, the fast takeouts than if you have a difficult more complicated situations yeah, 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 yeah. where you have to think a bit more and probably play more difficult stones and slower stones as well. That takes much more time. And of course now Canada using the, the new thinking time for a lot of their cash tournaments. 
There's been a big, big discussion about that uh, over a couple of years now. What do you think of that? Well, I know actually even the uh, WCF is starting to look at it. Of course, WCF is, you know, taking directives a lot from Olympic Committee and uh, television broadcasters that just want to do anything possible uh, to get these games down under two hours. Uh, it can be done, but I really don't think you need to butcher the game. You don't, you don't need to cut out so many things. But, uh, you know, the talk also of going to eight ends instead of ten for the world level. Let's go up that is an idea, and mm -hmm. things are talked about, or these things are talked over, definitely. But it's like any other sport, you know, whether you're talking baseball, you know, the football, the older sports. And uh, it always comes down to the, a lot of times the people that are making decisions that are running the, the things are traditionalists. And they don't want to make too many changes to the game. They like the way it is. But you know what? It's In this day and age, it's all about money. That's it. Especially in the days of the Olympics and uh, the Olympics being bigger and bigger. Huge events and nowadays. So here we're going to and see the teams trading hits, not really anything in play other than the one stone. I don't think the rock sitting on the back line will come into play. So they will trade off hits and get this end over with and hopefully blank it. Most of these teams are really good hitting teams. And hit and roll out. So yeah, they're they're just going to look to end this real quick. Quick and painless. Trying to get the game into the next round then in the next end probably. Mm -hmm. Of course, the advantage, you know, if you look for an advantage or, or the way they're playing, if it's good for one team or the other, it's always an, more of an advantage for the team that's throwing the draws because they will practice their draws, get their feel of the draw weight. You get a team hitting for a couple of ends and, you know, sometimes you just uh, lose a couple of inches here and there exactly. on, your, on your draw weight. Sometimes it costs you a couple of points. That is a that is a very important thing. Not only uh, for a single player, but for the team it, as a, as a whole to have this information about how the ice is is changing, especially mm -hmm. in the speed and the first two three ends. This is this is really important to go and get this information. And uh, if only one or two stones are draws. Um, you already have some information, and the more you get, the more the players can share the information among each other. So that's why it's important if uh, the team like uh, Mikel is playing hits, they, they have to hit and stay. Because if they're hitting and rolling out, the other team continues to play draws and Eventually, it'll catch up to them. Yeah, so that's what uh, Lang now has to do, Andreas Lang. The German skip has to play a hit and stay now. Making it difficult for Michel, or as difficult as possible in this open situation, to force a point and not Looks an like easy clearing. Looks like he might have got it started going a little bit. 
This is not what he wanted to do. He wanted to roll more to the center line to give Mikael a lot of house to roll to in case he uh, hits and gets anywhere near the nose and is forced by a mistake to take a point. So Michel now will blank this end, will, which Easy means way. he will just throw this one through and uh, this will save him the hammer for the next end, the last stone. And we will have to uh, solve some technical issues. Uh, if you lose our commentary, we'll be back in about a minute. We'll have to solve a couple of things here, my technicians tell me. And we'll be back, so stay online. We'll be back shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for staying with us. We're back online with this semi-final of the Swiss Cup Basel in Switzerland, part of the Curling Champions Tour. With, with me, yes, before Daniel Raphael. And we're going on in the second end here. Second player playing of Team Michel. Sandro Trollier. So it may or may not come into play as the game goes along, but the Mikel team this morning playing all of four ends against Dufour and of course Long playing the extra end against the team from uh, Hamburg. Well, that is a difference of five ends and you definitely, after such a long weekend, Hmm? On Sunday, you feel uh, this coming into uh, into play, the, the tiredness of uh, of your body and your mind, especially. Well, especially uh, the Swiss team is uh, was off for quite a while, probably talking with their coach and eating, relaxed, and just laying back and waiting. Yeah. While the Lang team was uh, playing the extra end, run down, grab some food, throw it in their body, and run back out on the ice. So. Yeah, and it's not only today, it's also yesterday. They came yeah. through the C road, right? And uh, mm -hmm. they had a long day yesterday, four games to go. Uh, finished at half past ten in the evening and started again today at what time? Eight o'clock? Eight o'clock, yeah. So here we've got an interesting situation. Actually, Long was a bit fortunate that uh, they didn't push their stone to be fourth counter. Because I can go to change it a little bit, but they're still going to try and play the double anyway. So Michel now in a much better situation than in the first end uh, to actually use his hammer his last stone advantage to get two or more points here. So he's going for the hit and stay and without giving the Germans again. The decision which stone to attack. Mm -hmm. Not sure if. Uh, I think the he was preoccupied by the stone in the forefoot, and I think the rest of the team at the other end was telling him maybe we should hit the uh, the rocks on the outside because they don't have the hammer, they don't have last stone. Whoa, 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 quite whoa, a build-up of uh, yellow rocks in the house. Exactly, and with that they could probably roll somewhere near. Uh, 
much better choice than what they were looking at before. Mitchell, of course, trying again to, to split the house and, 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 and get some separation between his stones. Mm -hmm. But in Lang's mind, uh, you know, giving up two when the other team has the hammer is not, not the end of the world. I mean, they were looking at uh, three and possibly four yellows. Before that last yeah. stone, right? Yeah, going down two is not such a bad thing in the second end that can happen. Well, it's like I always say, the positive thought is it should have happened anyway. <laughs> you know. Tip top. This one now okay. nice slipping a little, right here. a little bit further than yep. I think what they wanted to. Yeah, they, I think they swept it a wee bit. Mm. A wee bit too much. Daniel Herberg trying to yep. Yep. Hard. 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 use this there and Hard. 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 get around the corner guard and okay. hit okay. this. It's not even buried, is it? No. Yeah, they wanted to roll that shooter somewhere else, no leaving belief. it there is just now giving them the same shot again with backing, giving them something to freeze to. Yeah, exactly, and uh, as you can imagine, this makes it even more difficult for uh, the German team yeah. then to get rid of this stone, which is backed up by, yeah. by a red one. Could have curled a bit more, but doesn't like too bad. Yeah, just a little bit overthrown there. Line hung a little straighter for a longer period of time. You know, and these, these sweepers are so good. You always have to use them. You know, sometimes we always want to make the perfect shot with no sweeping, and as we all know, in this day and age, the perfect shot is when you do use your sweeping. That's when you use all your resources and uh, mm. try to minimize the amount of errors, because it's just so difficult to throw the rock at the perfect speed at the in the first place. So. Use your sweepers, they're good. And you s you, you mentioned it, it's the, the, the physical yep. part coming oh more and more into this yep. game uh, Alice. With, Alice. The, with the with the with the importance of the sweepers. Oh a little fortunate there that he he didn't hit more of that redstone. Yellow spinning okay, off so we're back to what we were four shots ago <laughs> definitely the precision of the german team not yet where they where they wanted it's a bit of luck in it but getting there so if you have questions or comments, we're happy to take a look at them and trying to answer them. You can send us an email to life at curlingchampionstour.org. Life at curlingchampionstour.org. Uh, to give you the answer just right here and there. Oh. That, of course, is brought oh, to you oh, by yeah, yeah. Ice Cube. Yeah. Go, 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 go. Oh. 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 
So splitting the house again, making sure that the uh, stone that is throwing is actually behind. Would have been preferable to have it even, but you know, probably more more important to have it behind than above the stone that's already in the forefoot. Yeah, now they're high, now they're looking at the uh, at the double again. Okay. The position of the Yellowstone before, uh, as we spoke about four four rocks ago, was such that they couldn't throw the double because of the uh, jam on the back red ones. Okay. Now, well, still not an easy shot, is it? We can then with Peel spiel, El. Some chance to to jam in the not darüber. Then they might do it. Yeah, they're don't they're not really convinced about it. Okay. I think they're just gonna try and hit and uh, stay in front of the two red ones. But that's what you mentioned. If the uh, yellow stone that is now behind the T line on the left side from this perspective was up in front, it would have been much easier to 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 hit the double. Mm -hmm. Not like this, it's quite Ice. difficult and the chances are Ice. big that Ice. the other one will jam on the back. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's been good, Steve. Good. It's been Mikael. It's sunny. Taking absolutely no time to put the broom down, communicating the weight to the vice skip. The weight, the speed that he will be throwing. Yeah, those two have been playing together for I think it's three years now at least. Mm -hmm. And uh, they know each other really well. Really good team. Uh, spending a lot of time together also off the ice, so that's yeah. probably yeah. also very important for these yeah. guys to have yeah. the confidence in each other. Yeah. Oh. 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 So the exchange of rocks paid off for, for Lang. Yeah, that uh, is a mistake of Michel and mm -hmm. that is only one for him. And with that, he loses the hammer for the next end, has only one point off. And we'll have to have a look at how the Germans will play with their last stone advantage. We will quickly introduce the teams to you. As we have the little break in between the ends. Andreas Kempf, uh, leader of the German team. But it's... Daniel Neiner, who plays lead right now, I think. Daniel Neiner, 24 years of, old, of age. Daniel Herberg, playing third for the team of Andreas Lang. Andreas Lang and Daniel Herberg played with Andy Kapp before. Andy Kapp retired. And Andy Lang, the skip of this team now, took over from Andy Cup. Andy Cup here still in the picture. And the Swiss team, Simon Gempler, the 26 years old IT guy who's spending a lot of time now for curling together with Sander Trollier. This team is for the first time, I don't even know, uh, I think in history of Switzerland for the first time we've got a professional curling team. Those guys are really dedicated. Claudio Pats, third in this team. They quit their jobs and uh, focus on curling totally for this season at least. Uh, could get the funding together to actually uh, 
make a living out of it. Sven Michel, the skip of this team, 24 years old. And this team was third in the last year's Curling Champions Tour, already showing their potential. And part of this potential, Robert Hurleyman, their coach, he's really experienced. Uh, well, uh, experienced and also uh, confident coach for this team, which I think is important for a young team to have. More information on that team, teamadelboden.ch, if you're interested in these guys. And we're in the third end of this semi-final at the Swiss Cup in Basel, Swiss Cup 2012, Curling Champions Tour, third event, I think. So truly an up-and-coming team, up-and-coming, so to speak. The last couple of years, they've been at or near the top of most of the CCT events. They're slowly but surely making their experience, exactly, and uh, they played the European Championships last December in Moscow. Didn't have such a successful time there, but I think it's really important for these young teams, especially, uh, to, to get that experience and get these this exposure as well. It's not an everyday thing. They seem to be handling the pressure quite well because what we see a lot of times with these kind of teams is because they're semi-professional if you want to call that you know they put pressure on themselves to actually win the tournament or be in the finals and make make money because they have expenses but uh, and it actually turns out to be a negative thing for a lot of teams it's uh, quite detrimental but uh, these guys are handling it well, and you can tell they're enjoying what they're doing, and part of it is having fun. Yeah, you said it. It's, uh, it's for these young guys. It is a big decision uh, whether you want to uh, put everything on one card and play curling or uh, go and pursue a career somewhere else. the Swiss team making a just a bit of a mistake the last end having an open hit for two and actually rolling out yep I'm going to take oh, oh, oh. one point so actually losing the advantage of the hammer yeah that's now the advantage of team Lang in this end they of course try to score their two here and the Swiss trying to place the center guard and get behind it now as the Germans were a bit too heavy before. So because the, the guards are tight to the house and staggered, uh, Lang has two options, which is to continue keep the, the play clean or just to come around and force the issue. I think the difficulty is with the angle of the two guards out in front, if he tries the double peel, he could actually jam on the, the back yep, red one the back of the house. Would have to cross over the, yes. the uh, face of the second stone, and that makes it difficult to get it behind or get it next to the red one in the back. See that here? Well, a lot of people would say this is a bit of a mistake, but I class this as a, a good miss, because you've actually changed the, uh, the landscape of the, the front of the house a little bit, spreading those, those two guards apart. So you can use either one if you need to, or even to double them out and rolling the shooter into the rings. So now this changes the shot a little bit for, for the Swiss team. 
now having to play the hit and roll, they can't afford to, to go straight in because then, you know, they could be facing too many German stones. Yeah, so they would have liked to actually roll a bit further in. Yep. Mm -hmm. This now gives Lang again the option to do the same and yep. get into the middle behind his center guards. And Daniel Herberg Daniel. will try whoa, whoa, to back, back, back. do exactly this. Whoa. Yep. Whoa, whoa. Obviously nine. both teams nine, nine. struggle a bit with the curl there. But this one paid really well. Exactly what he wanted. He wanted it to, pull, uh, to roll a bit further, but this is already really good. Oh. So according to my information, uh, with the awesome. hammer, Swedish team of Ericsson took three points in the first end. Wow, this is a score against the Canadian ring. Shoot it, shoot it, shoot it, shoot it. Probably take a look after and confirm that. Yeah, I can see it in the uh, left side of our picture here that there is a three on the scoreboard. Here we are, Dice against Ericsson. Score 3 0 after two ends. Dice has to catch up this. Sven Michel with his second last stone in this end. Right away. I think he fulfilled the task. I guess that's part of the uh, universal curling vocabulary shooter. Speaking of the uh, stone that's been played, if you play a take out, the stone that's played is the shooter and depending on what you want to achieve, you want to roll with the shooter or hit and stay. Is that right? That's correct. It's just I hear Sven Mikkel always talking about sweeping, sweeping the shooter, keep an eye on the shooter, which is a tendency to Sometimes the uh, the less experienced front end players doing not so much at this level, but when there's a takeout being played and lots of rocks are in motion, you got to make sure everybody does their job and yeah, that's fun. Yeah, and you, that's part of the communication. You have to make sure you got in place. Everyone knows what's the goal of the stone that's being played, where things have to go. So we did get a question on our 
live at okay. live at curlingchampionstour.org address exactly and uh, we'll we'll answer that that question in the next end this end almost uh, complete Swiss team debating whether they should just hit it and stay or play the come around. Play the come around of the staggered guards is a bit of a gamble. If you don't make it, you have an opportunity to land to uh, either hit or draw for two. But if you do make it, then... Uh, you know, at least you get the point back that you wasted away in the last in. That's true, but I think they decided to tap the rare one out of the house. Yeah, yeah. They will play uh, probably hack weight. Uh, weight, uh, hack weight stone and, and try to just push that rare one out of the house and stay with their shooter in the house, more or less where the broom is now. On the right side, and that should leave uh, Lang, uh, uh, a fairly simple draw to the eight foot, probably depending on where the stone rolls to. Probably with backing, not that they should be using the backing anyway, right? I don't think they should, and I don't think they will use it. Uh, I think they're experienced enough to know that this is not the mindset you should you should have when you play your last stone ball. <laughs> of course, the Swiss team really wanted the stone to stay in the rings because if he had rolled out, then would have gave Lang an opportunity to just blank the end. Well, Lang hasn't got that opportunity now. He's forced to make that point and draw into the house. And there's another uh, interesting aspect coming up in the Swiss team's discussion now. Uh, uh, the skips when Michel told the sweeper as well, clean the stone. Because obviously they, they thought it had picked something in the very end. Uh, and this is also something sweepers tend to, when they think stones are, are where they should be, they are good, they tend to stop sweeping it and if you don't clean it it's such such yep. a big danger that it picks up something in the last couple of meters and destroys the whole thing. Yep, yep, leg it up! Yep, brauch! Will over the team! So the to draw for his one. Seems to be curling a lot. Uh, it should be okay even if he touches the yellow. It'll actually help him slow it down. So that there they are good. with their one point. So we're one even after three ends. Both teams not able to score more than one point here. That makes it more interesting for the coming ends. Three ends done and we'll have a quick look at the score in the other semi-final. The Canadian team, they say, against Swedish rink Ericsson. And what you see here is uh, something that is more and more common every day is these post-end meetings just to prepare the plan, see how everybody's feeling and uh, try to figure out if everybody's on the same page. So you saw the score there on the next sheet. <laughs> it's 3-0 still for Ericsson and not been finished yet. We will for sure update you with this one. Yeah, you mentioned it. It's uh, it's 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 part of this uh, mental part of the game as well. This this preparation to make sure communication is right and 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 all these these meetings to come together and make sure that uh, all the team. Cut players, all the team members know what everyone's thinking. So is that something you coach your teams as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when you look at the uh, 
the heyday of curling when when Armin used to curl as a competitive curler. The skip was the boss. He did it all. He knew it all. He was the one that decided. Nobody had any input. And uh, the, it, it was just a different, again, uh, especially now with the, the introduction of the uh, free guard zone. Uh, we had a different mindset. It was more of a early end, middle ends, and late ends. You know, the, it was more of a widespread thing. Where now, it's just every end you have to go in knowing that everybody's in agreement and knows what they're doing and have decided on a plan as to what they're going to do. Attack, defend, uh, uh, put the first rock in, you know, throw up a guard. Yep. And that, of course, is also putting more and more pressure on every single player and they definitely work on this mental part of the game as well. Mm -hmm. We see that in other sports as well, uh, there's, there's, there's many different sports where the mental side is being more and more appreciated as being very, very important mm -hmm. and it's the same with curling. And that's what I try to tell my players now, uh, the, the, the teams that I coach. You know, there is no weak link anymore. Everybody's got to be part of the team. Everybody's got to make some decisions. Uh, you can't just leave it to one or two people every single time. I mean, four players are on the ice. Maybe somebody will see something that the three others don't. So. Well, that actually is interesting. I had that this or uh, a, a discussion on on, on, an, on a different topic actually to Nancy Murdoch, the performance development coach of uh, Scotland. Um, their concept is is different than many others. They they put their teams together. They don't. They select their players with potential and then put them together into teams. And this is a new concept um, which many people think that it will not work as they see curling as a team sport and the team has to work but there is another side to it as well being a team player and being able to put in uh, your your power your energy your performance into, into a team with just three other guys and and making it work as if it was a team that's been together for years is even more difficult but if it works, it, it could be even more efficient. If you have a group of players, let's say eight to ten players, and you can fill them in into two teams and make two good squats out of it, why not try? Mm -hmm. I think the, the theory is good. Uh, the key, in my opinion, is maybe the players that are involved in this system have to be have to accept the system for what it is i mean you cannot you cannot go halfway whether it's the chinese full professional system or or scotland system or you know anything else that's a that good is shot it. There. you have to have exactly a very nice shot here making a the whole th situation a bit more open now. But getting back to the, 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 the Scottish uh, thinking, sure, if you've got a pool of players that know this is the way it is, they each individually work on their game and uh, try to improve their skills and whatnot. After that, it's just a matter of playing a few spiels and, and seeing how they they gel together and not have to worry about. Yeah, and if, uh, if every one of these players is trained the same way, thinks the same way, probably the differences between two teams are not that big anymore and you are you can replace players much more easily than what is, for example, in Switzerland where you have teams staying together for quite some time, which is a different system, which is... Uh, working quite well as, uh, um. as well, but it's just very hard then and to then replace a player that has played an important role in a team. 
because they just they got a different style of play they, they're used to different uh, tactics they're used to different uh, mental work so it's two different models and i'm really really uh excited to see how these different models again come together in the sochi olympics and to see how these because now it's been a full cycle more or less where these systems been in place and, and to see which system worked out what way it's going to be really interesting and of course you you will get into uh some countries which uh you don't really have a choice because you just don't have the talent base you don't have the pool of players from which to select so uh, sometimes you have to adapt your your way of thinking from maybe two or three different systems just to make it fit for for the the players that you have in for the one team in, in your country yeah daniel herberg of the German ring yep. here, whoa, whoa. playing a double takeout. Works out really well. And it spins up Good. just up. a little bit. I believe behind the guard. I think there is a guard in front. I think it's a bit open. Not really sure about it. Can't see it right now. Yeah, it's coming. The guard will appear at some point. I'm sure we'll see it from a different perspective. There we go. There we go. Yep. Fully open. Full open. And with the curl in this ice, that would be open plus. Open plus, <laughs> exactly. Armin and his crew making a really good job here with the ice. It's a pleasure to play on. And Claudio Pats now with the attempt to hit. And I think he wanted to roll a bit. On what side? I don't know. Yeah. Well, it looks like they're going to roll away because... Uh, just wasn't making the move that they thought it would. So maybe we can take a look at this question that was posed on on our emails. And I know there was a, a question. So we have a, a question yep. coming yep. from yep. Italy. Yep. Person I know very well, Fiona, Fiona Simpson. Nice clean, uh, mother of Marco Pascale. Very good young player over there in Italy. And she was uh, talking yep. about the uh, backswing oh. delivery that Mark Dacey uses. And maybe we can give yep. a little bit of history as to uh, what was the backswing. And of course, as we all know, ice wasn't the way it was, it is today, way back when. So uh, we needed the backswing to get the rock down the ice. So, you know, the. So it wasn't the. Uh, 25, 26 seconds uh, uh, run of, no. a, of a draw at that time? No, no. Uh, we we even had a character, I, I don't know if those pictures are still on the internet, but there was a man called uh, Richard Bellier who, uh, who curled out of New Brunswick, and there's actually a picture of him with his backswing, which was over his head. Uh, and he actually, if I'm not mistaken, I can't vouch for that because I wasn't around at the time, but he used to use that backswing even on draws. So, but then uh, Andre Furlong of uh, Quebec, man of many talents, developed a lot of things for this sport. Uh, just to sidetrack a little bit, Andre was inducted into the Canadian and Quebec Curling Hall of Fame this past season. Quite an honor. And uh, he, uh, he perfected, if you want to call it, or popularized the uh, split times. Um, 
he came up with uh, the no backswing delivery and also the inventor of the performance brush which is used by just about everybody today now everybody's trying to copy it or making their own version of it but uh, Andre came up with this uh, delivery to uh, especially to minimize injury I guess was one of the reasons you know uh, I don't know if you've ever tried to uh, throw a rock with a backswing but you know you do that 10 ends for a whole week takes a lot of energy out of you uh, then the uh, the no backswing came to be and <laughs> what's funny is you see guys like uh, like a Wayne Madaw now who actually uses the backswing for his takeouts but the no backswing for, for his draws so. yeah which not many players can do actually having two different uh, deliveries in place let's put they it this are way they I are very very different i don't recommend it <laughs> they are very different i know four years ago when i was involved with china the one of the vice skip skip players uh liu ray wanted to start to use the the backswing for his take yeah, and whoa, whoa, he, he he tried it he he used it in practice and it, it worked fairly well but we got to the worlds in Moncton in 2009 and I realized it was actually detrimental to his game so I just told him to stop and uh, he went to the no backswing for all his shots before we come to the conclusion of this discussion, just a quick update update on the game. Actually, uh, we've seen quite Amazing nice up. here uh, the the game behind the centre guard and uh, the two teams trying to roll behind the guard. Now Sven Michel is forced to actually deal with this stone behind the guard. It's fairly far uh, in front of the guard, so it's enough uh, space to curl behind and. Uh, play a uh, peel to to get it out last rock in this fourth hey. end here Whoa. 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 here we go this was the peel for the blank this end still 1-1 one, one after four ends yeah the backswing no backswing uh, discussion it's it's still in 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 place, my I know my skip. He used to play with a backswing, and uh, I was one of the first ones actually. I know that uh, was told not to use the backswing when I started curling 20 years ago. Um, I was one of the first one who didn't use any backswing, and in my club, this is still uh, quite common to use a backswing delivery. Really, depending on how long the people play, of course. Mm -hmm. There's older people that just started a couple of years ago, and they, I'm, I'm quite, l I'm quite uh, lucky. They do not uh, play with the backswing. Mm -hmm. We would have had a lot more injuries with that. And it's funny because that's, uh, it sort of touches a little bit on my my coaching career, and that's, uh, I I finally had to realize this past season now being with the uh, the Czech Republic that uh, you know I, I just assumed everybody knew about the the Thompson hack and the performance brush was is actually smaller on the bottom than on the top and the balance plus is the other way around uh, all these things that uh, you know I just took for granted and then I realized you know I'm working now with a generation of of curlers that only know the backs uh, the no backswing and the uh, the Marco hack and uh, you know the performance broom and uh, not the performance but the balance plus broom so you know I actually had to one of the first clinics I had to give in uh, in the Czech Republic was how to use the Marco hack they automatically assumed you just put your foot in it and off you go and it'll just send you wherever 
And uh, so I gave him a bit of a history of why the Marco hack came to be. And then he looked and they said, yeah, it really makes sense. You know, Marco designed it to make it easier to, to especially throw like takeouts on the outside edges of the 12 foot, which in the past when you had the old, you know, Thompson hacks and the, the, the just the pieces of rubber or wood or whatever they had at the time, uh, you had quite a bit of difficulty getting to the outer edges accurately and with a lot of power. Because the, 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 the place where you could actually uh, get the power out of wasn't that, uh, no. that well shaped at that mm -hmm. time. So now everybody knows why it says Marco behind that hack. As I was saying in the last draw, Marco Ferraro, the man who actually came up with this design, he, uh, he went to the Briar, represented Quebec uh, at the Briar, I believe it was 1986 in Chicoutimi. And uh, he came back and he says, no, he says, I got to come up with something better. And he, he designed after many attempts, of course, but a lot of rubber was wasted. <laughs> And uh, he came up with uh, with the Marco hack, yeah, which has improved the game quite a bit, actually. Quite quite some history here, and uh, that's all these small things that improve the game, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. the brushes, it's the hacks, it's the sliders, it's all these little inventions of people that thought, well, there has to be something else, there has to be different solutions, and they come up with something, and and, and, and suddenly they're revolutionising actually the curling world. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm always proud of my Quebec heritage, so I try to promote it a little bit. So Marco being from Quebec and Andre Furlan, who was my mentor as I started my coaching career. There you go. Also, coaches have mentors, mm -hmm. like the coach for the coach. Mm -hmm. He's the one that got me started. And Michel here has to deal with two guards in front of uh, the house. Uh, both of them actually uh, are a threat to his yellow stone in the middle because both could be run back by the German team. So but not, uh, not easy to remove because either way you hit these might go s one of them might go straight back exactly you would actually probably the only thing is a really fast rock and uh hitting it really in the middle between the two probably mm -hmm. hitting the right one from this perspective first and if you hit the back one and you're fast enough um the damage is probably not as big as if you just hit the normal take out there I mean, there's also a, an outturn take out there to hit the the right one on the outside. There we go. Well played, well executed. And he could very well have made the triple with the with the outturn going wide. But the margin of error being, if it did over curl slightly, he would have taken out his own probably jammed square and left the guard in front, so the risk versus reward was not uh, not good. Yeah, the reward here definitely was good, and this forces Lang to do something about it, and I think he decided to play the draw here. I think there's a guard in front on the left. No, he's playing the take out. That's what I, that's what I thought. I was I was a bit confused. No, sorry about that. Playing the take out, curling a bit too much, but just leaving the red one in the house. Michel having an easy take out here, just no, removing no. things. So we sort of got sidetracked on that question. I don't know if we actually answered it, but. Armin shaking his head, no, we weren't even close, but uh, 
you know me. I get uh, babbling and talk about a lot of nothing. But uh, you see the backswing today, and you know you can relate it almost to age. Uh, look at the Glenn Howard who won Basel, the men's world championships at the age of 50. And he oh, still you. has the backswing, and I don't think uh, I'd ever see him change unless he really had to. Yeah, there are still people around with the backswing, but I think it's not very popular. But the other thing, too, is like, like we originally mentioned, it was the ice conditions. I mean, they're just so good now, and the ice is fast. Y you just really don't need it. You know, the conditioning of the athletes also. The leg drive, the equipment, the sliders. Yeah. You know, we spoke about the hack. Yeah, so it's, all, it's all that that makes the sport and it also more precise, right? I mean, nowadays you really have to be able to hit these run backs perfectly. You have to be able to draw to the button. And this uh, is only possible if you have the equipment and the ice for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was funny. I was in uh, Czech Republic in Prague. And I was showing them a video of uh, Garmisch, I think 72, was the infamous uh, Canada-USA final. And... Uh, there you had the backswing with the corn brooms, and they actually thought it was quite hilarious, but <laughs> it was even funnier when I pointed out the fact that the guy was throwing the last stone for the there world championship with a cigarette oh. in his mouth. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's been different times, definitely. Yeah. So You can only see this nowadays at open air yeah. curling tournaments. Yeah, yeah. There they still got the old spirit on. And here, Michel's team trying to draw into the house in front of Dad Radstone to make it difficult to remove. While Daniel just showed me the score on the other sheet, the semi final, Ericsson stealing a two in the third end to lead. 5 nothing after three ends against the Canadian rink Dicey. Um, we only see it on the left side here. We will have a look at uh, that score. Uh, of course, always uh, in the breaks between the ends and keep you updated with that. While we here have the uh, semi-final covered Lang against Michel. Removing that stone and this is a very open end again. As we've seen it in last four ends, actually, uh, there's been quite some interesting situation, more or less difficult situations, uh, but there's never been the big score or any, any chance for a big score in this uh, in this game. I think it's a, just a tad different what's going on on the next sheet. And even more so now with Daisy being down 5 nothing. So the teams have been conservative, but there's also been a couple of mistakes here and there, especially with Lang having that, uh, Lang, uh, Mikael having the Michel oh. having to take out yeah, and rolling out. Hit for two and rolling out and only taking his one, so. Exactly, yeah.
that might have changed the game a bit if 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 there was a two nil lead uh, that usually changes yep. the game a bit. One stone or one point uh, in front that's is that's nothing you you really worry about. In the worst, if 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 worst comes to worst, in the eighth end, uh, one down, you make the one, you go to the extra end, everything's open again. Uh, usually, extra ends they work a bit differently anyway. Yep. Uh, so this game here Aye. really close, and I'm quite sure that we can expect Aye. a lot more uh, like this Aye. until the very end. And in the very end, we will have uh, okay. some really intense minutes here, probably. And the other game, you said it, 5-0, that's quite something you have to worry about. So Daisy has to play even more uh, offensive to actually... Oh, I see, it's 5-1 now. He made a 1 in the fourth end, had to score probably. Well, that shows the... The balance between these two teams, which obviously is not there. Mm. So of course now with a with a team like the Swedish team of Ericsson, very very good on takeouts, they could uh, pretty well clean it out from here on in. So another mistake. Michael trying to blank. To make a one here. Had to trying to blank and. We didn't even have to know the result. We just saw the expression on his face when the rocks made contact. So that's twice now. Once that's a open hit for two, he rolled out. And this time he wanted to roll out and he hit on the nose. Exactly. And that's not really, um, he's not known for that. It's not typical of it's him. It's not yeah. typical at all. Usually this team is also uh, very well on, on, on takeouts, they, they know how to play them. They do not only uh, play a defensive game, but um, they, they play takeouts really well, and it's uh, a bit alarming that Michel has these problems in with his takeouts. Especially because I expect the German team to play more and more aggressive now and to really try to get some points here. Okay, nice work from the lead Simon Gempler here. Good evening, Sean. So common tactic, you take the lead, you throw the first one in, just see what the other team is doing, and of course they throw up the corner guard. Yeah, that's what you can expect of this German rink. Um, when they get the chance, they like to build up something. Probably also the heritage of Andy Cap a bit. Mm -hmm. Three of these guys here, the three here, they played with Andy for quite some time. Three. And I heard that he was playing in Oslo. Uh, and I don't know if anyone confir can confirm that, but uh, I heard he was seen around there. I heard the rumors also. So, uh, retirement is not as, uh, <laughs> relaxing as he probably imagined it to be. Or maybe that's what he needs to relax. A bit of curling now and then. Mm -hmm. One of the things you will notice, uh, that the viewers will notice is because the ice curls so much, uh, a lot of these better teams and of course it's teams that probably practice it they're actually throwing a lot more positive handle what what we call more turn because normally you're you're wanting anywhere between like 
two and a half to three yeah. turns there you go, on, yeah. a, on a stone there you go, on a sheet of ice. If you throw less than that on this kind of ice, it's yeah. it's just unforgiving. Yeah. It'll, it'll yeah. just go all day. No sweeper will be able to hold it. Anyway, we'll just cross the ice uh, almost perpendicular at some times. It is uh, really tough then. And this also has impacts on your on on the speed you you're throwing out mm -hmm. of the hack because uh, to give that much more handle, um, you either turn it faster, which is difficult to do because you want to be on the broom, mm -hmm. and uh, if you don't want to do it that way, you give it more positive, as you say. You have that uh, movement of your whole arm to give it a bit more positive, and then of course you cannot. Um, come the same speed out of the hack mm -hmm. as if you played it normal. So you have to adapt your delivery actually to the handle you're playing. And that's why I was saying a lot of teams will practice it so that you're not just coming out and, and having your coach tell you before the game, oh, make sure you put more turn on your stone. And then, like you said, you, you have no concept anymore of the, the speed and I mean, there you saw previously where uh, the Mikael team threw the guard and it just gently came to the center line, whereas the German team threw a little bit less turn, a little less handle, and uh, they had to sweep it to get it by because it was just going sideways. Yeah, that's what we see, and that is something that in Europe I think is not yet as common as in this, probably in Canada. I don't know, uh, maybe you can tell us more about that, but I think it's in Canada where the ice and, 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 and the rocks especially tend to be a little more aggressive than, than in most ice rinks here. Um, not here in Basel, because uh, Armin's taking care of this quite well, but in other ice rinks the ice is not curling as much, the stones are not as aggressive and their people tend not to uh, not to practice these things well again you're when we talk about Canada we talk about a large number of curlers and a large number of curling clubs I mean just to give people an idea in uh, just in the Montreal region which is uh, just one city, there was 18 curling clubs, and that's in the east. If I'm not mistaken, Winnipeg had 21 or 27. Anyway, and those are curling clubs with uh, the smallest one, I think, is six sheets. So with that amount of curling clubs, the thing you're running into is different ice conditions. So you got to be able to throw in different situations, curling ice, straight ice. You have to know how to play everything. Yeah. And uh, and adapt, like like we said, put more turn, put less turn, uh, throw it positive, throw it in out even. I mean, a lot of places now, you throw the rock in out and, and it's gone. <laughs> you, you're not even gonna see it come back. So, uh, yeah, so in Canada, if, if you're the type of player that's going to travel a lot and play in a lot of dis different situations, uh, like you said, you, you almost have to have a book on rocks. You know, we're going to this club. Well, this club, the rocks are like this, or the ice is this way. Exactly. That's... Uh that's quite common here, actually, as well, because in Switzerland, distances are not as uh, big as in any other country, and uh, we still, in, in, the, in the small space we have, we got about, I think, 44 uh, dedicated ice, uh, curling ice facilities. So with these 44, you, you tend to play in probably at least uh, 10 of them each season if you don't really travel and uh, if you do if you travel around the country playing a lot more 
So uh, people tend actually to uh, make their notes and uh, write down their uh, their discussions about the stones and everything. The difficult thing a bit is uh, if you don't really travel to the same ice rink uh, all the time, uh, things change over time. Uh, rocks get uh, reshaped and. Uh, with that also the notes you probably made will change a bit. Maybe the ice technician do some things and change some sets and rematch things. So it's always kind of a bit difficult well, this to is, do. Uh, this is one of the reasons that in the past we could pretty well rely on the fact that this wasn't going to happen. That, you know, handles weren't going to move. So we usually would write you know, sheet three at this curling club, Yellowstone number seven is a cutter. But that's because we pretty well knew if we went a year later that that rock would still be there. Still be there, yeah. But what they do now at the world level is they give you the serial number exactly. of the stones. So, exactly. you know, that that's another thing that the coach has to take care of or the, the rock person on the team. Yeah, it's getting nope. bigger and bigger, and uh, it is a big task, actually, yeah. during the Worlds and the Europeans. Yeah, yeah, when I look at these uh, these guys, the coaches and the fifth player, uh, the alternate, uh, having these uh, these tasks and these these uh, hours of actually selecting rocks and uh, looking at rocks <laughs> and practicing. In the night. In the <laughs> night. In the after time. After the whole day has gone by, then you get to come out at night during night practice and match your stones and make sure you have, you know, the stones properly set for your players the next day. And probably your players the next day will not uh, listen to you when you tell them, I'm tired, I don't want to talk to you. I just practiced the whole night. Mm. Uh, so the other thing you have to factor in, just to close out on this discussion about rocks, is uh, not only do we have a lot of curling clubs in Canada, but you, you said there's about 44 curling 44 clubs? 44 ice rinks here, yeah. So 44 ice rinks, and I'll bet you not many of them are older than 50 years old. Well, no, probably not, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, you know, you go to clubs in Canada, you know, like my club is uh, established 1894, wow. and our, our stones were last changed maybe, you know, like we were lucky enough, we changed them maybe 20 years ago, but, you know, if you have a club that has stones that are 50 years old or so, you know, and then you go to the next club and they're, brand new stones from Keys of Scotland, then uh, it's two totally different things. Two different I mean, worlds. you've got a, a running surface of one eighth and the other one is almost like half an inch wide. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, that's probably a swift thing as well. And I see, I see just uh, looking at this picture that the yeah. stones are that moved down on the other sheet. So that is not a mass takeout drill. I assume that uh, this game is over and uh, that Team Daisy uh, shaked hands. Uh, we do not have to score update right now. Um, maybe our guys can give us the scoreboard quickly of that sheet. Here we go, 7-1 after five ends, and that's when Team Daisy shook hands. Probably something happened in the sixth end. Uh, they must have something gone terribly wrong, yeah. Actually, the, 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 the really bad situation must have been in the first end, and afterwards they were yeah. just forced to really give it a go and try and try and things don't work out, they get another two. Either that's that also or that's also curling. <laughs> I was gonna say either that or Daisy has a plane to catch. <laughs> <laughs> maybe uh, maybe the flight time is uh fast approaching. It might be, it might be. Uh we definitely see that when uh when we go downstairs and they're gone. 
because I know in the past, uh, I don't know about this tournament or uh, any in this vicinity, but there have been known for teams to just take their money and run and not even play the semis. So I know there's it's either this tournament or the one next weekend where we're having the women's masters here in Basel. Exactly, next weekend, uh, Women's Curling Champion Tour in Basel. The world's best, or some of the world's best uh, women's teams playing in Basel next weekend. And You're right, this is uh, usually a big discussion. Do you book your flights for Sunday evening or you stay till Monday? Uh, it's also a bit of a oh, it is difficult. it is next weekend. It says teams will be fined five thousand Swiss francs for any forfeit of the semi-final or final games. You see, so you forced actually to uh, get these uh, measures in place because teams yeah. tend to leave early. Well, it's I think it's it's. Uh, not such a big uh, discussion for the, I don't know, maybe maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's not such a big discussion for the team from overseas, because they mm. usually don't actually care if they get home on Monday or Tuesday, because they will be away for a week anyway. And most of them hang around, do the tourist thing anyway, so. And you want to leave yourself some time if you had a, a big weekend with curling and uh, you got a flight home. You want to leave yourself some time. Like I, I believe the Daisy team is here on their own, but in the past we've seen where the wives Hard. and the kids Hard. are here, and Hard. especially a beautiful Hard. city like Basel. Hard. Hard. You want to make a whoa, whoa. vacation out of it? Ah, a little bit of a mistake there. That's uh, one yellow, <laughs> I think. Yeah, I believe Michel so. Michel stealing one. And with that, going into a 3-1 lead, so you this game. Finally got rewarded for some of his previous mistakes. By a mistake of his opponent, to say that. Exactly. So at this point, he's probably telling himself, well, it's a point we should have had earlier. And there we see the time left for both teams. I think it's, it's two ends to play. It's uh, been six ends so far, so two ends to play with more or less 18, 19 minutes on the clock. That should be enough time, conveniently. The, the theory being seven and a half minutes for a team to play an end. And both teams still have uh, a timeout, as far as I know. Exactly. Oh, we did say we would fill in the viewers. In, in the last draw, there was an incident where Team Daisy was trying to call a timeout, and uh, they were not given the timeout. I did see that. And uh, we were kind of puzzled about it because the teams were told in the team meeting that uh, they would have one timeout each. But uh, when came time to call the timeout, uh, <coughs> uh, they weren't given the timeout. They weren't yet. given the timeout, and the reasoning well. apparently was because they had no coach. Exactly, that's what we were told up on the uh, on the Tribune as well. Uh, that they did not have a coach meant that they could not take the timeout. Um, I'm not sure if they just give the coach the travel time and then uh, let the clock run again as mm. consulting time. Which is coach's interaction. Exactly. Okay. Or if it's a proper timeout where you actually uh, stop the clock and give the coach a travel time additionally to the one minute timeout. Mm. So I'm not really sure about that. But the whole point being... Uh, that a lot of these teams are not using the timeout to discuss anything. Uh, they're using the timeout just to stop the clock. 
which uh, you see a lot in, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with professional basketball, like you watch an NBA game and uh, the last three minutes is like, you know, half hour long because they have Contact half a dozen timeouts and 30 second timeouts okay. and TV timeouts and and the next thing you know, it, it just drags yeah. on forever. Exactly. That's how you uh, you see these points uh, four seconds on the clock, and uh, you still you still see the points going. Yeah. That is um, weird to some people, definitely. Here is not as bad. Mm. We do have these right. timeouts, and uh, they're uh, relatively uh, limited. Uh, of course, also there we had uh, that. Uh, topic covered in the very beginning about uh, consulting time, about uh, playing time and, and of course this is a discussion as well but I think it's not um, a really a big issue about these timeouts. But I the, think ru uh, the rules are how they are and are the way they are and, 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 and you deal with what you have. Exactly. And it's, bo it's the same for both teams so. But I think one of the uh, the famous, uh, in my opinion, the famous situations where timeouts were, in my opinion, not maybe abused, maybe abused is not the right word, but was the 10th end of the Canada Scotland, Canada -Scotland, game Scotland in final. Moncton, exactly. where actually seven and a half minutes had gone by until Murdoch could yeah. play his last stone, exactly, yeah. So, and in this case, it was like, you know, the two timeouts were called back to back, and uh, I don't know, if I recall, Jules Ochard didn't say a whole hell of a lot in those two, two minutes. So. Definitely And I mean, not. what are you going to tell Kevin Martin anyway? So. That's, that's one thing, and on the other hand, uh, there is many people saying that... Uh, Everyone knew what he, or he knew and his team knew what he was going to play. Uh, and that was just, uh, as you say, to get some time uh, where the ice is not being played. And for those of you not being familiar with that, the ice changes as well. Now that the ice is played, as we see it here, with the German team just sweeping with stone, uh, a guard actually. Um, when the ice is being played all the time, uh, it keeps a consistent speed mm -hmm. and if you stop play for only five ten minutes you already uh, see some frost on the ice again and this changes the conditions very much so if you want to get your opponent into some sort of trouble you might well try to uh, get some time between his uh, two shots to 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 change the conditions oh and there we that have is a big mistake basically that's that's what you call what we call a rookie mistake okay. not yeah, saying man. this player is a rookie at all but it's sitting in the hack and trying to throw the perfect shot he wanted to make that, that double. double yeah whereas the the key and the important thing was to to clear the guard and then if you get the double, then that's the bonus. But uh, exactly. he had his in his mind that uh, he wanted to get the double and he ended up missing. Yeah, he had to hit it very thin for the double and that's what he tried. And uh, with that speed, if you don't deliver it perfectly, uh, it will not fall and that's what. And we were talking about ice conditions earlier. We had mentioned in the last uh, draw in the uh, Daisy Ulsrud game, that uh, even the amount of players, like the the situation in the Daisy game, was that all of a sudden the next sheet the game was over. So that's eight bodies that are gone. There's no activity there, and that side of the sheet that they were playing on suddenly got the frost build up. Yeah, I mean, Armin definitely can say a lot about these things as a as a really experienced uh, man when it comes to ice. But uh, that is always an issue. It's uh, it's a funny story. There is an ice rink in Thun near Bern, uh, not far from here. Nice takeout, by the way, here. Yeah. And uh, that has a uh, parking uh, underneath the ice rink. 
and you always know when you play on Saturday the stores close at 5 o'clock and you've got a game let's say from 4 to 6 stores close at 5 half past 5 all the cars are gone out of the car park the ice will change, change dramatically, dramatically dramatically it is a huge thing there and <laughs> it's funny because the first time you're there like why did the ice change? And then suddenly people say, well, because the cars left. And, and you're like, cars are all what gone. cars leaving? Come on. <laughs> but then you realize, oh, the cars are underneath the ice rink. Now yeah. I realize. So on that last stone, a little bit fortunate there. Got a bit of a break. So now Sven has to decide what's more important is to get rid of the guard or the stone that just rolled in front of his own. And I would probably venture to say that playing a team like Lang, you'd better get rid of that corner guard. Uh, that's what I think too, and that's what Claudio Pats in the hack actually told him as well. I think... Uh, you have the advantage of knowing the language. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, they're just discussing this topic and clearing the corner guard definitely is uh, probably more important against Lang because they will always be able to actually try to if they're able to we just saw two stones being uh, being in trouble there not fast enough but against Lang he's always able to bury something behind that card mm -hmm. if you clear it you can still deal with everything else later this is all black Because now, as you can see, for those who are not aware, yes, it looked like a very nice shot, picking that out, leaving the yellow one there. But if you look at the position of the uh, corner guard, you can see that by burying a rock behind it, you can b get in behind and still be shot. Still be shot, right, that, exactly. That's the key, and I think that's why I think the uh, Swiss team was better off just peeling that corner guard. Well, they're lucky here now because this is way too heavy. Just yeah, that's going not through even close. That's freezing the hack. Back. Yeah. So uh, now they, of course, can deal with a totally different situation the Swiss guys here they don't even consider the corner guard anymore because they want to put more pressure on having a second rock in the house but actually if you would be really consequent you could also just uh, so now we have the Swiss team calling the timeout let's see if they get it but they have a coach they do have a coach they do have a 45 year old Robert Hurleman very experienced guy, uh, played on the international level as well with Christoph Schwaller, the brother of Andy Schwaller, who's a quite a well-known player in Switzerland as well, now being responsible for the development of the Swiss national or Swiss elite players. And so here's the coach now. Robert Hurleman. Of course, he had to have time to come down from the tribune on top and down the stairs. Ah. Vielleicht können wir ihm so tappen, dass er nicht wicken kann und ein Doppelspiel gleichzeitig sein kann. Wir müssen ihn ein bisschen die Sonst können wir noch so, so versetzen. Also, das ist aus, der Schott der Herr Innen. Der Schott der 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 Innen. Ja, wir haben jetzt gegen halt hier gespielt. Da wüsste ich gerade die Linie, wie es etwa läuft. Hier habe ich keine Ahnung. Aber das ist ein Doppel-Take-Out. Aber sie wirklich muss perfekt kommen. Auf einmal. Ich denke, maybe one of the concerns because of course we always say, look, uh, maybe he should be uh, thinking about the score being up two and peeling the corner guard. But the way this ice curls, 
the rock that's in the top 12 foot is actually a corner guard. It is. So you can like draw in behind it. So. so you actually always leave something for your opponent. So that's what they see as well here. And then they decide uh, I think, to that cap kind of that yellow one. Tap, yeah. I don't know in which spot exactly they want to tab it, but I assume that it uh, should be fairly straight. The only danger you could have here, well, there's the danger of setting up the double, of course, but Lang trying to get two would probably not play the double unless he really had to. But uh, he can't afford to tap this one to the back rings because then they definitely will use the corner guard again. Yeah, and definitely they do have something to freeze on uh, behind. Mm -hmm. so that's what they fear now, I think. I think they fear that it is a bit too heavy. Uh, still good. Still in front of the T line. It's actually quite. Quite well positioned because the other thing he wanted to do also is try to roll, not too much, but try to roll the shooter so that it covers part of the forefoot for the next shot. Maybe just to disturb the Lang team from drawing in there. But I think they're just looking at playing the double anyway. They're, they're thinking. Yeah, I think it's a quite interesting uh, situation. The roll inside here also means that if you want to play the double and actually get your shooter into a good position, you would have to cross the face and hit the back stone on the outside. Which now will dictate the speed. Exactly. You will throw. Exactly. If you're too heavy, you if you face the risk of rolling out of the rings, which would be, which would be the the worst thing that can happen. Because what definitely has to be here, even if you if you play the double or not, nah, is, is 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 one thing. But what you want to do here is you want to have a stone in play. Still, mm -hmm. if you roll out of the rings with your shooter. The other team will uh, be able to do whatever they want. As if that means clearing the guard or drawing in. Yeah. yeah, just rolling out here would be like, like we say in English, defeating the purpose. Would be uh, going against what you you were thinking. So, I think they personally they should be coming around and freezing the, the one in the forefoot. So. I mean, they just, yep. at this point, they just can't afford to give up a steal, that's for sure. Well, they do not have a coach uh, with them. Uh, well, they do have uh, Andreas Kempf, the, 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 the fifth player with them, so that might be a possibility to call in. Otherwise, I would have suggested, uh, why don't you tell them? Mm. Let's have a look what they uh, do. They try to play the double takeout, I think. Let's see how that works. Yep. Hard. 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 Alles, alles. That's what we said. That's what you definitely don't want to happen. Shooter rolling out, leaving uh, open and good situation for the Swiss team again. So things continue the way they are. Looks like the German team will be forced to take their one. Of course, Mikel here will try to bring it in as far as he can without giving them an open hit on the shooter for the point. So on the center line, block off as much as the forefoot as they can to force him to play the takeout on the side stone. Which, of course, always is the risk of uh, rolling, rolling out again. Not even rolling out, just rolling away. Rolling away. And, you know, giving up a steal of one. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's a lane. Long issue. 
because the upcoming stone being the last stone, you know, whether you roll out or not, as long as you fr roll farther than the shooter, than the uh, original stone, then, uh, yeah. So that's, now it's starting to over curl, so. Still well positioned, I think. Yep. So now he's basically giving him. That's what we call in English a teaser. That's he's, it. He's giving him. Teasing him to play the double. To, to take play out. the double and say, look, you want to try and blank it. Uh, With the risk that they yeah. uh, fail and he makes the one. Or maybe even two. Or maybe even two. <laughs> well, that would be a big fail then. <laughs> We do not hope for that. We don't no. hope for any of that. We actually, oh, okay. well, at least I do hope that they will uh, make that point that will give us a very interesting last, last end then. Because then they would be down one without last stone. And we would see a very interesting uh, last end here. Yep! Whoa! Achtig! Whoa! Yep! Whoa! Yep! Yep! Hard! 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 Okay. Turns off. That is good. That is the one point. And it is two to three for Sven Michel, or three to two to say it from that perspective. Sven Michel and his team leading, going into last end. And Andy Lang, Daniel Herberg. Yep. Daniel Neuner and uh, Marcus Messenthal, of course, they have to make sure now that they get their guards into play. That's the whole key now is the, the play of the lead, lead stones. I mean, with the free guard zone, the way it is, it's set up so that, you know, the, the team can have a chance to come back. So what I do a lot with the... Uh, my top level teams, the uh, national teams, is we actually pose the question just to see if everybody on the team is on the same page. And I ask them, what is your preference going into the last end? Do you want to be one up without or one down with? And most of the time so far, I usually get the four players thinking the same way. But... Uh, the reason I do that is because the last thing you want to do is get into a game like this, semi-finals of a CCT event, and you come into the last end and two guys or even okay. one guy at the four is arguing, saying, no, I don't think that's a good idea. So Exactly, and it's a lot of it's money a uh, uh, mistake. People are getting a bit nervous when they're getting close to it, and uh, the discussions are easier to have have them in beforehand and it is actually a matter of taste yeah, I think oh, as well uh, oh, oh. with or without uh, hammer in the last end um, or even the extra end then uh, this is something some people like the uh, the one side some the other I personally like going into the extra end without last stone because I think it's quite difficult sometimes, at least, for people to really get rid of every guard. But uh, I've experienced differently as well. In Oslo last year, we played against Brewster in the uh, tiebreaker for the uh, quarterfinals. <laughs> they just uh, threw a takeout triple peel and everything's gone and then you think okay well um, triple peel that was it then you you pretty much done so it's definitely a matter of, s yeah. of taste uh, I think uh, I think a little bit of reasoning with some of the teams that I've spoken to is they'd rather go into the last end uh, one down with the hammer only because their theory is with the hammer I should technically Make score at least one point well, at least one, so by thinking that way 
big miss there. What? what we call the soft peel or the tick shot. Probably one of the more difficult shots in <laughs> curling. Definitely. Still some debate over whether they should get consideration for percentage points because it's such a difficult shot. But uh, yeah, so the teams were thinking if I have the hammer, I should score one point, which again gives me another chance in the extra in end. The extra end to steal so, one. you know, they're, they're thinking it's two chances, whereas the other way I have I'm only one what? chance. But a lot of times, you know, I've seen some of my teams say we'd rather be one down with and then they get the game time and they change because ice conditions, who they're playing against. You know, you're playing against a team that doesn't peel very well. You know, then there's always reasons for changing. Changing is, is exactly. fine. You can change as long as everyone's on the same page as exactly. you said it and everyone knows what, uh, what the team strategy and uh, tactics is. Mm -hmm. And here the goal definitely is to remove that guard. Sandra Trollier trying to peel it off. Does so. And the time is not an issue, I think, or should not become an issue, because seven minutes and the last end's already half way through. So to recap, Mikel is up by one with the hammer, which is a good situation to be in at most times. So his idea is he wants to see as much of the forefoot as he can when he comes to throw his last stone. Yeah. So he will continue to peel <laughs> and then Lang will probably have <laughs> something to deal with in the way of maybe a tap back or come around, even a come around of a rock in the forefoot, yep. which I've seen before. On this side, it's definitely possible. Yeah. For those of you who are familiar, uh, Mark Dacey, yeah. who, who just played on the next sheet, ended uh, the Furby run at the Briars by drawing two stones around uh, two, I believe they were two Furby stones in the eight foot. And then drawing for three on his last shot to win the Briar. That is probably a memory that some people <laughs> do not want to have refreshed here. Uh, some others would like. Uh, Mark Dicey definitely uh, would like to hear it again. Uh, but the funny part is that uh, I can't remember exactly what year that was, but when I was with the Chinese men uh, three years ago, we were in the Cactus Pheasant, which was one of the biggest events on the men's tour in Canada. And uh, the Chinese men did exactly the same thing to Furby again. <laughs> <laughs> he must have, bad, he and, must have uh, had bad memories on these things. Th that's the first thing that came to my mind was, you know, th doesn't he learn? <laughs> but uh, the Chinese men ended up uh, w making some good shots and... Uh, uh, they no, ended up tying the game. They the lost the game anyway, but they ended up oh, taking three to tie the game and go to extra end. Wow. And no that guards in sight. That is that is quite a performance against uh, someone like Furby, who definitely has his history and his records mm. in the uh, curling history. Yeah, I don't think he'd, uh, <laughs> he'd want to change trade any of his success for anything <laughs> I've ever done because <laughs> 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 I'm not even Help close. Out. Well, Help he out. had uh, some uh, journeys around different countries uh, coaching yeah. different teams. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're coaching Czech oh. Oh. Republic oh. right now. What? So here, Sven Mikkel 
figured because that last guard thrown was not exactly on the center line, this tells me that at least half of the button is open, which means quite a bit of the forefoot is open. So he decided to come around, take the rock out and in the forefoot and, and roll out. So even if they do draw in behind now, he will still yep. have a shot to, exactly. uh, to get to the button. And for him, it's really important now that uh, this, this left side from here is still open. Uh, if there was another guard in front, uh, the, the shot would, would have been different probably. Mm -hmm. But like this, even if it's totally buried, it's uh, still not safe. Worst case, he could get behind it with a, with a hack weight and mm. just pick it off. He's removing the guard still. Right decision, definitely, in this situation. Right, right decision, but the previous shot by Lang, it's funny because we always try to throw the perfect stone. And in my case, you know, I'm thinking, you know, why not go behind the T-line? Why not say, you know, I'm teasing you to follow me down? And building something up yeah, behind yeah. the T-line, yeah. You know, that's just a, a thought that can be used again it's depending on the ice depending on the conditions and yeah and uh, also depending on the opponent especially because uh -huh. uh, you not many people on this level probably will be teased by uh by such a stone in in in, in the back four yeah could happen could happen but on this level i think most people would peel Smart off the guard because yeah. but but definitely some some comment for all the players out there. Think of these things and look at what you're. Especially if you're playing a, a young team that's maybe shouldn't have been in this position in the start. They're nervous. Exactly. They turn around. They go, "Oh, let's play the freeze." And the next thing you know, they're giving you more back and the guard. So. Whoa, whoa. Okay, that's okay. Okay, uh, Germany now had to uh, face a trade-off. They they could have swept it a little longer, but uh, it would have come closer to their shot down in the middle of the of the house. So they said, well, don't leave it there, even though position's not perfect. Uh, it's not covering the whole stone, but it's better than being in and too close to the to the shot down. Mm -hmm. And also again, maybe not a team like like the Swiss team, but uh, maybe another team would say, oh, let's try and get the back stone with the out turn and they crash the guard and send it into the two yellows on the side and you know, all kind of bad things happen. Very well played. Good shot. Everything open. Two stones behind the corner guard. One of them giving some backing for Lang. Daniel Herberg and Andy Lang now deciding what they want to do. I think you got to use the corner guard because open hits. Mikael is just too good at blasting. Yeah. And, and besides, he's got the luxury of thinking that uh, he's up by yeah. one anyway. You know, even if it's if a tie game, it's even a little if bit he different. Gets a one, yeah. that, uh, it's not a real big problem for him because mm. he would have to hammer. Even if the German team would have a chance to steal one here, he's got the luxury of having the hammer in the, lo in the extra end then. Mm -hmm. And right now it doesn't really uh, look that good. No center guard here. Corner guard of the Germans to draw around, which they will do now. And by going around, uh, good. around the corner guard, yep. number one, it's slightly easier shot. Yep. The straight come around for the Hard German lead. team. 
Then trying to freeze it perfectly into those two yellows. Yep. And uh, it'll force uh, Mikael to uh, to throw the draw, which he hasn't thrown a lot of during this game anyway. Exactly. He's thrown a lot of hits. I think, I think that one, I'm not really sure if it touched, it was definitely close. I think it might have rubbed because might otherwise... touched a wee bit of it. Yeah, because we're looking at it now and it's partially open. And with the way that the ice curls, especially to the wings, we saw a rock in the Daisy game pass that much and come out the other side yeah. almost half a stone. Yeah, that's what we experienced quite a lot this weekend uh, in the games, that uh, things curl out on the other side again. So we get to see the, the young skip show his uh, touch after throwing a lot of takeouts. Just by being so given uh, yeah. But looks it looks good. good. Very nice. with his last rock of this game. Almost. That's on. And will it be enough? It will be enough to win yeah. the game. Yeah. Four to two. Yeah. Winning the semi-final. Sven yeah. Michel yeah. goes into the final against yeah. Swedish team Ericsson. And this will be... At what time? This will be at This will be at half past two Central European time. It's half past one now, so in one hour we will cover the final Ericsson against Michel. And we would be very pleased if you joined us again in an hour. I'm quite sure that this is going to be a really interesting game. These two teams played each other quite some time already. And uh, definitely know how to play. Good curling. This was the semi-final of the Swiss Cup in Basel. I had the pleasure to commentate this game with Daniel Raphael. Thanks for having you here. Thank you. My name is Renato Hechler and we are very happy you joined us for this game. Join us again in an hour and get some lunch in between.